Hey there, Mindful Travelers, and welcome to, to the World Schooling Junction channel. With a vision of building an inclusive global community, we strive to provide educational content to help world schooling families raise engaged and empathetic global citizens. In each episode, we meet remarkable people who are doing their part to make the world a better place. From responsible travel to world schooling hubs to family-friendly service opportunities, all of our guests exemplify what it means to be caring and selfless humans. introduce today's guest. Ashley Wright is a homeschool mom of two kids. When neighbor problems made their home unlivable, they decided to hit the road. They now live in a converted school bus traveling around the country. Along their learning journey, they uncovered something called game schooling, and I can't wait to hear more about that. So Ashley, thank you so much for joining us. I can't wait to get into this conversation. Why don't you tell us a little bit more about yourself? Okay. Um, well, I have a education background. I went to school actually to be a zookeeper, but before that in high school, I student taught violin lessons. And so after I got done with school and realized that the zookeeping field is really hard to get into, especially once I made became my husband and he didn't want to leave the state, it narrowed my options even more. So I started teaching violin full time. And so that's what I did for about 12 years. And well, my kids got old enough to where they were in and out and the house was getting hard to keep clean. And I finally decided, you know, this is just too much. Luckily it was right before the pandemic hit. So that was perfect timing. Um, and we've started a game schooling. Oh, let's see, our son was about five, I think. We were just kind of getting tired of Khan Academy and I heard about game schooling a bunch. So I finally was like, you know, let's just let's try this. And, cool. They did more math in less time and harder math than they had done before, and they were having fun, and it was it was amazing. What exactly is game schooling? It's learning through games. So it can be board games, card games, dice games, video games. Um, I you can do like just imagination or um, tabletop role playing games. A lot of people uh, school with game school with D and D, Dungeons and Dragons. Mm -hmm. And there's just so much learning to be found in games. There's a lot of like educational games, which my game Pizza Parlor is one of those where it's like, I designed this game for this specific learning purpose. But there's also a lot of games that are just really, really fun, but you happen to lear be learning a lot while you play them. Yeah, I, I come to come to think of it, I play a lot of games like that. So I'm looking right, right, right behind our video, we have our like game, uh, game shelf and we have a couple called ticket to ride and then trekking the world and uh those actually have like little things um where you learn about different locations and stuff like that and i never thought about it but you know like when i play with my daughter we always have her read those at the end so is that kind of similar to what you're talking about yeah exactly especially game like trekking the world i have trekking the national parks Love it. I really want their other two, um, Trekking Through History and Trekking the World, but they're such big games. And when you're living in a school bus, you really have to choose what games you bring with you. <laughs> so we have Trekking the uh, National Parks for now. But yeah, they've got so much cool stuff and you know, you're learning geography, you're learning about, you know, some cultural stuff, some habitats and um, ecosystems. There's just a lot to, and it, just, it opens up interest. You're like, oh, wow. That national park looks really cool. I wonder what else we can learn about there. Can we visit it? Or you know, what animals live there? You just there's so many questions that you can ask based on different games. Now, how do you balance the so there there's always that inherent competitive aspect with some games, um, and then the whole other thing of like turning it into work or schoolwork. Like how how do you avoid that trend as well? Well, so f as far as the competitive aspect, I do, we talk a lot. For a while, my kids used to always pair it back, and we all had fun, so we all won. <laughs> my husband used to tease me that I'd make a great t-ball coach. <laughs> <'Cause> <laughs> yeah. I was always saying that. 
you know, the kids go, my son was a super competitive phase, right about five, where like any chance of him losing or somebody else winning or something was major meltdown territory. So we played a lot of cooperative games and cooperative games are amazing because they have it built in that everybody wins or loses together. So those are one of our favorites. But um, you can turn a lot of different games into cooperative games. So we used to do that too. When my son was like three, he went through a phase where he was obsessed. Oh, yeah, three or a little younger. He was obsessed with get to ride. We didn't have the junior version. So we, I got down the board. This was before we had pets. We just put it on the floor. And he and I would draw a card and, you know, play a car or whatever. And he loved it, but we never kept score. So it was never a competitive thing because it was just, oh, look at these tra cool train cars we made. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but you can do that with lots of other games and just kind of be like, oh, well, what's the greatest score that the group can get? Or, um, gosh, you know, with Scrabble, we never keep score. We just put it out there. We also listen with games like Scrabble where my kids are just starting to learn spelling. Mm -hmm. They're eight and or, yeah, eight and nine now. So they're, you know, at that phase where they're starting to get the hang of it, but it's still really challenging for them. So we freely exchange tiles. We suggest words. We kind of just build a group crossword puzzle together. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. Um, but as far as keeping it from turning into work or like ex you know, school work, there was a period of time that we did a math game every morning. And it does kind of get a little bit, okay, well, this is, you know, this is the next step and just kind of a little boring. So we mix that up by making sure we have plenty of different games. And there's tons of free print and plays that you can do that can help add variety if you're like, well, more games is great, but I don't have the money. We also do um, a lot of thrift shopping for games, so that's a good way to add more variety in. Making sure that you're not just playing those schooly games, but playing the fun ones. So um, Boss Monsters is one of my son's favorite games ever. It's kind of like a reverse munchkin. Are you familiar with that game where it's a card game that you're, it's a spoof on D&D. Okay. You're, Draw, you're opening up doors, fighting monsters and stuff. Well, boss monster, you're the monster building a dungeon trying to kill off the heroes. Mm -hmm. So my son loves it. Anything fighting, he's all over. <laughs> There's tons of math in there. You know, all the trying to keep track of whether or not you kill the hero, what um, power, what damage your rooms are doing. There's math built into it. And he's not having to go, okay, another worksheet, but it's right in the game. So games like that are really, I think, key to making sure it stays fun. That's really cool. Now, did y'all do this? So I know you said you're a, you're a mother too. You have a husband, right? Like, did do you all do this together? So for, at first, my husband was working nights. And so the kids and I would get up in the morning. We'd have something small to eat. We'd play our math game before my husband got up. And then... You know, move along our day. Then we went through a phase where we played after we had breakfast with my husband and we all played together. Now we honestly don't play as much as we'd love to because we are traveling and there's so much else to do. <laughs> but we record a game every week, usually, sometimes two. And um, then we try to always play together. Sometimes one of the kids or another won't play with us because they're just not in the mood. I think that's another really important thing is that games be optional. You know, if the games are required, then it's like, okay, well, I have to do this. But if it's like, hey, the rest of us are going to have a yummy snack and play this great game. Do you want to join in? And if they say no, that's okay. But if they say yes, then they get to also enjoy the yummy snack. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I was thinking, incentivize it with ice. So um, taking, a, taking a step back to you talked about the converted school bus. How, how about you tell us a little bit about that? I'm curious what got you on that path and what that journey was like to actually create this and get on the road. Yeah, so when we decided, when I just, I woke up and I was like, you know what? We can't live here anymore. We were afraid to walk out our front door. It was, it was not good. So I was like, you know, they're never gonna change our neighbors. They're not moving. We just, we've got to leave. I looked briefly into just moving, um, but we were living in Western Washington and that is a very expensive area. 
Oh, yeah. <laughs> we couldn't afford anything. Yeah, we couldn't afford anything that was like what we already had. And my plan B had always been to world school. And I told my husband this years ago that I think things go south with the farm. We're just going to sell everything. We'll fly to South Africa, travel up. I had this whole route planned. Like, <laughs> I knew exactly what I wanted to do. So convincing him to instead of sell everything and travel the world with two little kids, it was really easy to convince him to let's just sell most of our stuff and instead travel around in an RV and, you know, stay in the States. And so that was a pretty easy sell. Then was looking at RVs, I saw an ad on Facebook for a company that did school bus conversions. And I always thought that a schoolie would be really cool, but my husband was working full time. I have, I am fairly physically capable, but I've got some limitations. And with two small kids and everything else going on, there was like, there was no way we were going to be able to convert our own bus. So I contacted this company and realized that, hey, this bus, if we were to convert our own bus, it would cost about the same as buying a new truck because the truck we had wouldn't be enough to pull the RV we would need. And an RV, even if we bought a used RV, there was, you know, the trucks are so expensive. The school bus was a better deal. So we con uh, contracted with them to build it and they did a lot of the work. It took over twice as long as it was supposed to. <laughs> it was supposed to take three months, it took six. And my husband had to go out to Idaho to help them finish it, get to a spot where he was comfortable finishing it the rest of the way. And then he brought it home and had to finish the flooring. Um, he had to do the, some plumbing stuff and propane leaks, leaks. And so he had to do a lot of repair of this sort of brand new school bus. But you also hear that with RVs all the time, that as soon as you get them, they just start breaking. So it wasn't that bad of a deal. Um, but yeah, so we hired a company to do it and then we, Kind of made it our own. That's really cool. Now, you, you mentioned you're traveling a lot and then you were trying to incorporate all these games. Um, do you have kind of like a a time limit for how long you keep a game? Do you exchange them as you're going to different destinations? Or how, how do you work the space component? So these... Is it really sick? These are some of our games. So this is what I did back in the house is I get back a lot of our games. Mm -hmm. And so the boards are kept in a separate stack and it makes it so you can store way more games. So I've got one, two, five hanging spots for games. We have these overhead bins up here that my husband thought we would use to store food in. And no, they have games. <laughs> <laughs> we have a Calyx that has a bunch of games. Well, it has some games. Okay, a bunch of games in it. Uh, it's also got books and other stuff for the kids. So we do have to dedicate a lot of our space to our games because there are so many games that's like, well, I don't want to get this one up yet. We also have a stack of games. Let's see here. If I can show you. Oh, Not really. Wow. I'm next for Globe. Those games aren't supposed to be there. Those are overflow games that it was like we saw at a thrift store. I was like, oh, this is a really cool game. I haven't seen this before. Let's get it. Or we got um, the, oh, what's the Geo puzzles, you know, for the world puzzles. Uh -huh. We got a big box of those. I'm like, well, we'll do those until they're ready to get rid of them because they're not ready to get rid of them. Well, we haven't done it, I hope they want since we got on the bus a year ago. So <laughs> <laughs> they've been living there and they need to probably be just used and then rehomed. But for a long time, my kids, you know, they when they're young, they progress so fast and change so fast that it's really easy to cycle through games and be like, oh, well, you've outgrown this game, so let's move it along. But now my kids are getting to the point where they can actually play adult games. You know, things like Ticket to Ride and Trekking the National Parks, you know, games that adults like for fun. So it's not as easy to change them out. I do have, so for my blog, Gypsy Game Schooler, I review board games. So that's one of my hard limits of, well, I have to review the game, and we have to have recorded it before we can get rid of it. So yeah. we actually did record Boggle. We haven't really played Boggle at all, and I finally realized, you know, I'm not going to play this game. 
I like the theory behind it, but I'm very noise sensitive. So anything that's really loud and rattly, it's just not going to get played in our house. So we recorded it and then we got rid of it. <laughs> so it was just one of those that, like, well, this isn't going to last. That's cool. So tell us yeah, a little so bit more it, about what, what it is that you do. So I, I know you mentioned you mentioned that you, you make games, you review games. Um, I, I know you're called the Gypsy Game Schooler. So tell, tell us a little bit about this identity and what it is that you do. Yeah, so for my blog, games, my goal is to have a, a playthrough video, not like one of those how it's played videos or watch it played. Like, I don't want it to be, they're not supposed to be like the really long videos, but just a short watch us play a bit of it to see if your family is going to like it sort of video. So we have an accompanying YouTube channel that doesn't have as many games on as the blog because it's a lot easier for me to write the blog, take some pictures and get that post out there than I'm sure you're aware with editing the videos and all that. My husband's my video editor, so it's a little harder for me to be like, okay, well, let's let's get this done. <laughs> In addition, I've got a lot of other homeschooling resources on there that I've, um, you know, our family has tried and either liked or not liked and reviews for those. Lots of books. We love books. So I went through one day and grabbed all of our favorite books and realized I had to make it into a dozen different pages because there were just so many books that we love. Let's see what else. I've got some freebies on there. Like I made a worksheet for playing math dice. If I know a lot of homeschool families do like those worksheets. My family isn't really a worksheet family, but I figured, hey, this is an easy thing for me to make and makes it easier for parents to see the learning in the game. And that's my for Gypsy Game Score. Um, yeah, the game so far is just a one one game thing. But um, I had Ani Pasta's Fraction Game is the best performing blog post about like a game review that I have and it's out of print and it's also very simplistic it goes down to a quarter and, and it's just it's you know great for little kids but then I get people asking me about fraction games for older kids I'm like well I don't really know I've heard of a couple others but I haven't been able to try them and I've heard lots of people wanting games with multiplication of fractions and division of fractions so I created pizza parlor for that purpose. So it's multiplication division of fractions that get more complicated than just one card. So I got down to one sixteenth. Oh wow. Now where where did the name Gypsy Game Schooler come from? Well, so Game Schooler that was pretty obvious. The gypsy came from us being traveling and I tried to do, you know, come up with other names and use gypsy. Yeah, you know, I tried Nomadic Game Schooler or Wandering Game Schooler, and they just didn't have the same ring to it to me. It's just like, I really liked Gypsy Game Schooler, so I kind of just stuck with it. It rolls off the tongue pretty well. I like it. <laughs> yeah. Um, now, if you were, so what would you recommend to people who would like to get into game schooling? How, how could they start? What would be the best way to, you know, go about that? So I would say start with something that's easy and simple to do so play some card games there are books that have probably hundreds or at least dozens of different card games in them that you can um, use you know, with just a regular deck of cards you know grab some dice and play a game of math dice math dice, math dice is really easy to diy all you need is just a handful of dice you need one or two dice that you can designate as your target number. And then the rest of the dice you use to try and create the target number. So it's really easy and basic. If you're enjoying, you know, that of games and you want to get more, check out your thrift store because there are so many games at your thrift store. You know, you, most thrift stores that we walk into, you find the classics. Scrabble, Monopoly, um, Payday. All those, they're great learning games, and they're so readily available for so cheap. So pick up a couple of those 
more common games. When you're at the thrift store, see what random little game they have that you've never heard of before. <laughs> Those can be a lot of fun. That's actually where we found Ani Pastas, was the thrift store. I think I paid maybe a buck fifty for it. That's awesome. Now, I'm curious, because you have a background in education, you have a master's, and, you know, um, so you're probably pretty well versed in, you know, your typical educational model, um, what the expectations are of that. Um, how do you, you know, how did you go from that world to playing so much in your learning? And, like, how, how do you find... I don't know. I don't know the right question that I'm asking. I'm just trying, I'm curious about that, that, that bridge that you created from your, your background to where you are now. Well, my background was never the typical public school uh, education sort of background. I mean, I went to public school myself, but when I got my master's in education, I actually specifically looked for a program that neither required the teaching certificate nor gave it. Because I knew that if I went into the public school system, I'd be one of those that went completely insane and like killed everyone one day because it's way too stressful for me. I cannot take that. But I do love, you know, teaching and I love working with kids, you know, teaching them. So I, I wanted the degree, but I just didn't want to be able to be like, oh, well, I could just go teach in the public school because it was not a good fit for me. So. I did do some volunteering in a public school to get my degree. Um, and while I was there, the teacher I was working with was really, really cool. Even though, you know, public school teachers have all these bits of red tape that they have to deal with and all these requirements, she was totally willing to let me use her class as a guinea pig for a couple of different lessons, which I was really <laughs> appreciative of. So I used music to teach them fractions. You know, we used rhythms and that to work with fractions. I think it actually did help them. So that helped. And actually, it was my classmates when I was in school or in, in my master's of education. It was my classmates that were talking about how their kindergarten students had to take standardized tests. I went, wow, a five-year-old is having to do a bubble test? Like, that just seems so completely developmentally inappropriate to me. I now realize that I think they were taking them on the computer and not filling in those tiny little annoying bubbles that I remember from grade school. But still, it's like, that's ridiculous. So that's what first made me decide to homeschool my kids. And then when I was volunteering in the public school, the teacher that I was working with one day, she was like, oh, and don't come in next week, kids are testing. I was like, oh, well, is there a different day or time you want me to come in? She's like, no, they're testing all day, the whole week. And she was obviously so upset about this. She's like, most adults can't stand, sit in front of a computer for 40 hours a week, and they're expecting our kids to. And so that really pushed me towards homeschooling. And then when my kids were born, I had learned a lot about unschooling, which is kind of learning through life and not you know, imposing the curriculum on the kid, but letting the kid lead. So I was really into that. And then my son, when he was one, was obsessed with letters. So I was like, well, I guess I'm teaching the kid to read, even though I was going to wait. But it's like, well, if he wants to learn, might as well teach him. So he read probably, um, if I had to do it over again, I would wait longer. But he was determined. <laughs> so, and then when I was, um, Early on, kids were probably three and four. We found a homeschool meetup play date group that um, now she's a really good friend of mine that she had founded. And so we started going and this friend was super big into unschooling, like very like radical unschooling. We haven't ever got to radical unschooling where um, you kind of let the kid lead throughout the life. We still had bedtimes and you know meal times and that sort of thing. But with her influence, that really encouraged me to relax and let it go. So that really helped. And yeah, just finally trying game schooling. That was such, I mean, it was a game changer for us. Yeah. 
Where do you see game schooling falling on that spectrum between, you know, conventional education, radical unschooling, you know, the two extremes? Where, where do you see it fall? I think it can fall anywhere because I know of plenty of people that send their kids to public school, but when they come home, they play games. And so they're, you know, call it after schooling or whatever, or summer schooling, where they focus on the games during their time. There's also people like us that are more unschooling that just incorporate a lot of games into their lives and everything in between. We also like to do a lot of unit studies. So, I mean, I guess you could call us eclectic, <laughs> but yeah, so I think you can apply game schooling wherever you fall on the spectrum, but I think it probably naturally follows closer to unschooling. But I mean, you can apply it, you, know, you can say, oh, well today we're gonna do fractions we picked out these two games that we're going to play for fractions and we're going to play this game for studying the civil war or whatever very interesting um the last thing because we're running short on time the last thing i wanted to ask was socialization component that's a big thing that we talk about in alternative education from world schooling to unschooling um with game schooling i feel like it, it just inherently has a socialization component um but have you found well I, i'm thinking from the from the aspect of playing with other kids but then uh i know you guys are you know kind of your tight-knit group traveling around the world traveling around the country um have you found opportunities to incorporate socialization or are there ways to do that with game schooling absolutely i will point out that there are a lot of single player games so it doesn't have to be group activity so if you do have a kid that's like, I don't want to play with other kids, that's okay. You can still game school, just pick up some single player games. They're great. Uh, but as far as, you know, playing with others, we don't tend to play too many of our games with our friends, probably because, I'm sorry, my games are precious. They're not going outside for the most part. There might be a couple of exceptions, but for the most part, they're going to stay inside the bus where I know they're safe and we're not going to get pieces blown off or rained on or whatever. And our bus is very small. So we have, I am sitting kind of in the middle of our bus <laughs> with our table pushed into the center. So you have a clear background. Um, the other side of me is our kitchen counter, which is a mess right now. So I didn't want to shut it off. <laughs> That's right. And it's just, it's very tight and narrow. In order to have all four of us sit at our table, we have to push the table to one side. I get in and we push the table back and everybody else gets in. It's kind of convoluted. Either that or we play like card games on our bed, which not really somewhere that I want to bring guests is to my bed. Totally understand. So we don't really do a lot of playing with other people with our games, but we are at a campground right now that is very family friendly. And my kids have made excellent friends. We were here for the season because I'm work camping here. And so, you know, we, I have to purposefully try to find ways for my kids to play with other kids because I'm very much introverted, homebody. I'd be delighted to never leave my bus. And my kids are the exact opposite. So I have to be purposeful and be like, okay, well, we're gonna go stay here for this time period of time where there's lots of kids, or we're gonna go to this park and make sure that you guys have a chance to play. So that's really important, I think. I totally empathize with you. That's exactly how we are. <laughs> my daughter wants to go with everyone and we're like, no, we wanna just stay home. <laughs> yeah i understand so that that's awesome that um man that's really cool you've given given us a lot to think about uh, i'm really interested to learn more about game schooling i'm gonna have to peruse your website for sure um before we go why don't you tell everyone where we can find you yeah james schooling sorry gypsygameschooler.com is my website and you can find me also on youtube pinterest i just started facebook Instagram and LinkedIn. And those basically all just lead back to the website, which is the best way to, you know, see everything and all of that. That's fantastic. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. And all those links for those listening, they will be located down below. Um, I encourage you also to go check out uh, Ashley's full transcript uh we do a written component of this interview process that will be posted on my website worldschoolingjunction.com 
There's a lot of other questions that we didn't get into today that some go even deeper into the impact that she makes uh, as she's traveling. Um, I encourage you to go check those out. There will be links on that uh, blog post as well. Um, Ashley, thank you so much for joining us. It, it's been a pleasure. I'm so excited to learn about game scrolling. Can't wait to go check it out. Thank you so much for having me. And for all of, all of you listening, uh, thank you for following us all the way through to the end. I encourage you to subscribe to our channel. We have other guests coming on, other guests that have been on um, that talk all about alternative education, uh, family-friendly service opportunities, and just general ways to make the world a better place. So thank you for joining us, and don't forget to travel mindfully.